Welcome back to the third session of our series, Understanding and Exploring Network Epidemiology in the Time of Coronavirus. We've been lucky to have two great tutorials so far, the first by Laurent Aubert Dufresne and the second by YY On. And today we have Sam Scarpino, but before I introduce him, let me give you a preview of what we have coming up next week. We have Janestra Bianconi from Queen Mary University of London, who's going to talk about epidemics with containment measures. Uh, just as a reminder, this program is brought to you by the Combined Program from the University of Maryland in partnership with the University of Vermont's Complex System Center. And I want you to stay engaged. If you missed our tutorials from the previous weeks, I know some of you are joining here new this week because we were able to have, have expanded Zoom capacity. So if you missed our previous weeks, please check out our YouTube channel for videos of tutorials and seminars. That's Combined Network Biology at UMD. And you can get to that UMD, that YouTube channel from our event website just directly from combine.umd.edu, which will take you to, has links to the YouTube channel and to the website specifically for this network epidemiology series. I also encourage you to follow us on Twitter using hashtag net underscore COVID, or you can follow our co-organizer, Juniper Lovato, who has been so instrumental in putting together this effort. Um, and you can also follow me on Google at Gervin Michelle. So I finally want to encourage you to ask and answer questions in the chat window that's worked well in sessions so far. So we invite you to do that and then we'll bring up a few questions at the end to our speaker if there's time. So with that, let me introduce today's speaker. We're delighted to have Sam Scarpino from Northeastern University's Network Science Institute here with us today. Sam has been on the cutting edge of research in COVID-19 um, and he's gonna talk to us about some of his recent results. He leads the Emergent Epidemics Lab at Northeastern University, where he's an assistant professor. Um, in addition to having an appointment in the Network Science Institute, he has appointments in the physics department and health sciences there. Sam's background is um, in biology. He got his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Texas, but also um, combining some of those tools uh, with techniques from physics and applying them to a variety of systems, uh, most recently, as you'll hear about in, in epidemics. Before going to the to Northeastern University. He had a, an appointment as an assistant professor at the University of Vermont. And before that, he was an Omidyar postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute. And so today we're super delighted to have the opportunity to hear about Sam's recent work. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sam. Great, thanks so much, uh, Michelle, for the introduction and for inviting me uh, to give a seminar today and, and thanks also to Juniper for all of our hard work co-organizing and, and to the combined program and also to the Complex Systems Center at, at the University of Vermont. I also really appreciate uh, everyone showing up uh, for, for the seminar and, and I hope that for many of you who won't have an opportunity to ask questions that you, that you follow up uh, afterwards with any questions or comments. Is everyone able to see my screen? Okay, I guess I realized I asked the question without, without actually seriously hoping that everyone would unmute and start talking. Great, so I'm gonna talk today about the effect of human mobility and control measures on the COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, but I'm gonna go there in a little bit of a, a, a detoured fashion. So I'm gonna start by talking about a key parameter for lots of uh, situational awareness around epidemiology and epidemic modeling, this, this number that you've often heard of referred to as, as the R-naught or the basic reproductive number. I'm going to talk about some recent work we've been doing 
uh, trying to understand how we might be able to better capture some of the features about that number that are so attractive uh, without incurring some of the, the confusing costs associated with interpreting uh, different values for different diseases. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit about the human mobility changes that we saw primarily in China as a result of COVID-19 and then focus on some very recent work involving the metapopulation dynamics of COVID and in particular how we think the sort of hierarchical neighborhood structure is affecting, uh, affecting disease transmission. And then if there's time, I'm gonna end with what I think are some important future directions both for COVID, infectious disease epidemiology and, and the broader community of individuals working in the sort of complex systems integrative biology fields. By way of introduction, I have two pictures. The first is from 1918 pandemic influenza. And you might imagine that one of the reasons I'm showing you this picture is that we are up against probably the biggest public health emergency that the globe has faced since, since 1918. However, the reason that I'm starting with this is not because it's a comparator to COVID although it certainly is in many contexts, but because I want to use it as a comparator to the 2013-2016 Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa. And the reason that I want to do this is because both of these pathogens, Ebola in West Africa, 1918 influenza, have very similar epidemiological parameters that would suggest that the global risk of transmission might also be quite similar between these two diseases. And as you're probably aware, one of them, the 1918 flu, swept the globe, infecting perhaps a third of the entire population, while the outbreak of Ebola in 2013-16 devastated Western Africa, but was confined to a much smaller geographic region and a fraction of the total outbreak size with respect to the global population. So what am I mentioning here with these epidemiologic parameters? I'll give a very basic introduction to the reproductive number, assuming that many of you are familiar. I have a slightly more technical definition under the asterisks here. But essentially, it's the average number of secondary infections that's caused by a single infected individual. Now, as I say in the bottom, there are a number of specific caveats to that, which it has to do with the entire population being susceptible, a single introduction at the beginning of, of the outbreak, uh, and a number of other assumptions. But you can think about it as the average number of secondary infections. And the reason that we're interested in this number is because if that number is greater than one, that means that every person who's infected is replacing themselves with at least one other infected person and as that number gets bigger and bigger than one, larger than one, you have increasingly large outbreaks, again, at least under a number of assumptions. That's part of the reason that measuring and trying to understand what this number is, is a very early part of all epidemic studies into emerging infectious diseases. And one of the ways in which individuals compare different diseases to each other, as we see in the whiteboard here from the movie Contagion, the public health officer is comparing influenza with an R naught of about one to smallpox with an R naught of about three. But as I alluded to in the past few slides, the 1918 influenza pandemic had an R naught of about two, meaning every infected person infected about two other people. The 2013 2016 Ebola outbreak also had an R naught of about two, meaning that both of these diseases look very, very similar from the perspective of this single number, the basic reproductive number, the R naught. However, 1918 influenza caused one of the most devastating pandemics in history, infecting somewhere around 500 million people, which maybe is around a third of the global population. While as the 2013-16 Ebola outbreak, no doubt devastating to parts of West Africa, infected a mere fraction of that 500 million from 1918. And that's of course not accounting for the fact that the world population size has been growing exponentially since 1918 and we have a much larger population, a much, a much denser population. So one of the big issues with this R naught, this basic reproductive number is we'd like it to be a measure of risk. How large do we think the outbreak is gonna be? How likely is a small number of cases going to grow into a larger number of cases? 
But when we look at these two different comparators, 1918 influenza and 2013-16 Ebola, they have essentially the same reproductive number, but wildly different outcomes in terms of the public health consequences of these outbreaks. So why then are we so obsessed with this number? Why is it it's everywhere? Even when we're not in a pandemic situation, we are inundated with values of these basic reproductive numbers. We see them defined in major Hollywood films. Why is it that we have these numbers acting as such a large part of our understanding of the epidemiology of infectious diseases? Well, part of the reason, and this is a screenshot from one of the foundational papers in the field by Kermack and McKendrick, where they're deriving some of the results that I'll talk about in a second. Part of the reason is that we have an obsession with mathematics. And I don't mean that as a good thing. What I mean is that I often hear as a biologist that we have a robust method or a rigorous method. And what they really mean is that they just have some Greek letters and some equations. And so whether or not a method is robust, whether or not a method is rigorous, while rigorous may have a specific definition in mathematics, depends quite a bit more on whether we think the assumptions that go into the model are plausible and reasonable given the situation that we're trying to describe. The second reason that we're so obsessed with r not is that there are simple equations we can use to translate these numbers into an estimate of how many people or what fraction of the population is at risk of getting infected. So on the y, the x-axis here, I have the reproductive number going from one up to four. Remember for diseases like influenza and Ebola, it's around two, as we'll come to with COVID, it's probably around 2.5. Once you get to larger numbers like greater than four, you're into the realm of pertussis, measles, smallpox, diseases that infect huge numbers of individuals in the population if they're susceptible. On the y-axis, we have the equilibrium total infected proportion of the population, meaning the disease moves all the way through the population, and this is the proportion of individuals that you would expect to be infected. I'm gonna come back and explain a couple of assumptions that go into this in a second, but what you can read here on the y-axis is that a value of 0 0.6 would mean that 60% of the population was infected. A value of one would mean that 100% of the population was infected. And I have three different ways in which researchers have translated these values of r naught, the basic reproductive number, into estimates of the total infected population size. And as you can see, they all make slightly different, they all result in slightly different relationships between the r naught and the total infected population size. But what we can see across all these different approaches is that you have a nonlinear increase in the expected proportion infected at equilibrium as the r naught increases. So for an r naught of 1.5, we might expect somewhere between 40 and 80% according to these estimates. While as for an r naught of 2.5, we might expect somewhere between 60 and close to 90%. So an increase of just one additional infection per person on average, you go from in the neighborhood of say 30 to 80% infected up to you know, perhaps as much as 90% of the population infected under these assumptions. So one of the reasons we're so interested in this number is because we really do want and need a way to rapidly calculate and effectively communicate the risk of these infectious diseases. So what are some of the issues? Well, one of the issues with this number is that it's highly dependent on the local population structure, the demography, the social contact patterns. This is a slide uh, that was kindly shared from Dina Mystery, a postdoc at the Institute for Disease Modeling, who did her PhD in physics at Northeastern University in the Vespignani Mobs Lab. And what Dina is showing in this slide here is the r naught for a different pathogen from 1.5 to 2 on the x-axis versus the attack rate. You can think of that as the percentage of the population that gets infected. That solid black line is what happens if we don't care about the social network structure, the population, demography, the household structure. We just assume the kind of random mixing assumptions that you, a lot of you are probably familiar with. And then in the different colors, we see what the estimate of the attack rate would be using the observed household contact structure and more information on the social networks for different countries uh, from Australia, China, 
India to Israel, Japan, United States, and South Africa. And the important point to take home here is that just by adding a tiny bit of realism, and this is not to downplay the incredible amount of work that goes into this, but just adding a tiny bit of realism, you get a large shift from the expected outbreak size, even for the same reproductive number. So for a reproductive number of 1.7, you might have 55% of the population in Russia infected. You might have close to 65% of the population in China and over 70% if you were to assume random mixing. So what does this mean? Well, what this means is that the social contact networks, the household structures, the demographic patterns measure uh, matter immensely when it comes to translating the same reproductive number, the same average number of secondary infections into an estimate of the total infected population size or the percent of the population that's at risk for infection. The second reason has to do with ongoing work from Professor Brandon Ogunu's group at Brown looking at the role of free living survival for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 and environmental transmission. So one of the results that we saw very early on is that the survival of SARS-CoV-2 varies dramatically between really low survival rates on surfaces like copper to really high survival rates on surfaces like plastic. And so Brandon's group developed a susceptible exposed infectious recovered model that also includes an environmental component where you would imagine that an individual deposits infectious virus on a sheet of cardboard or a piece of plastic and that virus is sitting around waiting for someone to come by and become infected. And what Brandon's group was able to derive is that on the x-axis here is the amount of time that these surfaces remain infectious after they're exposed from very, very short amount of time to really long amounts of time in the case of plastic versus the effective R naught, the effective number of secondary infections coming from that reservoir on the Y axis. So you can see for surfaces like copper, you might have an R naught of around 2.25 or 2.5. Whereas for plastic, it's well over three, approaching 3.25. And as you should remember back a few slides, there's a nonlinear relationship, a very steep relationship between small increases in the R naught and large increases in the total infected population size. So the difference between copper and plastic could be the difference between 40% of the population getting infected and 90% of the population getting infected. So not only does the social contact network matter, demography, household structure, but the kinds of environmental variables that are at play in terms of transmission also greatly affect the reproductive number. Just very briefly, Brandon's group was able to show that these kinds of environmental effects appear to strongly modulate the epidemic curves in places like Italy, Iran, Switzerland, here on the y-axis, we have the daily number of people infected in these different countries over the first month of the outbreak. A model with the environmental component on the left-hand side and a model without the environmental component on the right-hand side and a significantly better fit to the data with the environmental component. Now, of course, there are probably other explanations that could account for the differences in those curves, but nevertheless, there's evidence here that including this kind of environmental component is a critical factor in explaining the day-to-day -day dynamics in COVID-19 outbreaks. However, one of the criticisms, and for those of you that follow me on Twitter, you've seen this playing out over the past 24 hours. One of the criticisms is that everyone knows there are these big problems with R0. Everyone knows that models have assumptions. Nobody really takes this thing seriously, this one minus one over R0 or one minus e to the minus r not estimates of the total infected population size, nobody really believes those. Here is one of the leading infectious disease epidemiologists in the world quoted in the Atlantic, and I've blocked the names out, predicts, that's the individual, that within the coming year, some 40 to 70% of the world will be infected with COVID-19. This is directly plugging the r not into those mass action mixing equations. Here's another one. Another 
giant in the field of infectious disease epidemiology and modeling. The overriding question was to figure out the size and shape of the iceberg, meaning the total cases that we don't observe. Most experts thought that each person would infect 2.5 other people, which is the r naught, which gives an attack rate of 60 to 80%. Plugging the r naught directly into those formulas and communicating that result to the guardian. Also saying 60% of the world's population is an awfully big number. So despite the fact that we're being told that everyone knows there are these problems and understands the assumptions and is working with them effectively, we continue to see in infectious disease outbreak after infectious disease outbreak, major figures in the field quoting numbers that we know are demonstrably false with respect to the underlying biology. So we might not know what the appropriate social contact network structure is, what the appropriate demographic structure is in China for COVID-19, but we sure know it's not random mixing. And we sure know, as I'll explain in a second, it's not coupled with all the other assumptions that are required in order to derive those curves, get to these 40 to 70% numbers, 60 to 80% numbers. And as I'll say towards the end of the talk, this kind of logic is what leads governments to go for the quote unquote herd immunity strategy, because they believe that if you just let the wave pass through the population, that you'll have 70 or 80% of the population infected and you won't have a subsequent wave. What we show very convincingly is that it's not going to be 40 to 70 percent. It's going to be somewhere like 5 to 20 percent, and you're going to have multiple waves of infections because you're still going to have a large fraction of the population susceptible, meaning these herd immunity strategies are not going to work. So not only are we communicating things that we know are false, despite saying we don't do that, these kinds of communications also affect public policy that literally cost lives. So can we get a more realistic estimate? So I agree that we want to be able to calculate one or two numbers very early on during an outbreak and translate that into a risk of the total infected population size. Is there a way that we can still do that? Can we have a relatively simple, easy to communicate model that still gives us these estimated final sizes and, and obviously we believe it's more realistic, a more realistic estimate of what the size is. So these are the assumptions that go into that kermack mckendrick approach for translating r naught into the total infected population size, translating an r naught of 2.5 into 80% of the population infected. The disease has to result in either complete immunity or death. Rarely something we know about an emerging infectious disease outbreak. The disease is transmitted in a closed population, which means no mobility, no metapopulation structure, no quarantining and people fleeing quarantines, none of, none of that, closed population. All individuals are equally susceptible. Contacts occur according to the law of mass action, meaning random mixing, meaning the way that I decide who I'm gonna have lunch with. After this is I'll put everybody into a Zoom waiting room and I'll draw a random number between one and the number of people in the waiting room and that person will pop in and the two of us will have lunch. And a deterministic analysis is appropriate, meaning that we don't need to account for stochasticity. And as you might imagine for a disease like COVID-19, where we see lots of stochastic events driving some of these infection dynamics, that determinism is really not a safe assumption, especially if we care about things that are rare early on in the outbreak. And this goes back to foundational work by Lloyd Smith et al. in 2005, trying to understand the role of these super spreading events on individual variation in the number of secondary infections. So now moving away from the average number of secondary infections or the r naught, so the average across everyone, to thinking about variation from individual to individual and how for diseases that have super spreading, meaning some individuals, some settings, some locations might lead to many, many, many more infections than others, can drastically change the risk of a disease growing from a small number of cases into a large epidemic. So here we have the proportion of infectious cases in the population on the x-axis and the expected proportion of transmission events coming from those cases. So the way you would read this is, okay, I have 20% of my population infected on the x-axis. And then for SARS, I go all the way up until I hit that black line that's labeled SARS. And I turn left and I go over to about 0 0.8. And so for a disease like SARS, I'm expecting that 20% of the people that are infected give rise to 80% of the cases that come later. 
for a disease like measles and smallpox, 20% of the people infected might lead to 60 or 75% of the cases. And as we go down towards this random mixing, we get to the situation where the r naught, the average, accurately describes what's happening in terms of the, the population, meaning that 20% of the population gives rise to 20% of the cases, 40% to 40% of the cases, that solid line there. Part of the reason we care so much about this for COVID and for other diseases is we could label SARS as Ebola. So it turns out SARS and Ebola have fairly similar dynamics with respect to around 10 to 20% of the cases that are infectious now leading to 80 to 90% of the cases that will be infectious later. Whereas for 1918 influenza, pretty much everybody gave it to two other people. So 20% of the people that are infectious give rise to 20% of the people that are infectious. And this difference between Ebola and influenza is why influenza infected a third of the population and Ebola did not. Diseases that have more variability in the number of secondary infections, more super spreading events, a smaller proportion of the infected population size giving rise to a larger proportion in the future, those diseases are less likely to spread, they're more likely to die out stochastically, and they are easier to control with public health interventions, with behavioral modification, with physical distancing. Whereas for a disease like influenza with relatively little variability, they march along deterministically, they are harder to control, and they are much more likely to both grow from a small outbreak into a pandemic and also infect a larger proportion of the population. And it turns out one of the biggest pieces of uncertainty still for COVID-19 is where it falls in between SARS and Ebola and influenza. We know it's not SARS and Ebola because we were able to stop those diseases with public health measures. We know it's probably not 1918 influenza because it, COVID-19 does appear to be more reliant on super spreading events. So work that I've done with Laurent Bear Dufresne, who gave the first tutorial, uh, which if you haven't watched, I would highly recommend. It's a fantastic overview of a lot of the methods that I've been discussing today and many others that I won't have time to cover. The same with, with YY's tutorial that followed uh, the second week. Antoine Allard, who's a professor at the University of Laval, and Ben Althaus, who's head of epidemiology at the Institute for Disease Modeling. And so what we did is we followed an approach that has been developed in the network science literature by pioneers like Lauren Ansel Myers, Mark Newman, and others to apply probability generating functions to bond percolation models to understand the effects of social network structure, stochasticity, relaxation of those assumptions that I listed under the kermack mckendrick approach. So very briefly, what do I mean by this? Well, imagine that this incoming arrow here at the bottom is an infection. We can't see the person that it's traveling from, but imagine there's another node at the bottom of these arrows. And that circle gets infected. Now, what can happen? Well, on the left-hand side, one of the things that can happen is nothing. That person recovers or dies and doesn't transmit infection. Another thing that could happen is that they could transmit to one other person who then transmits to two other people who then spark a chain of transmission. We could have another event where there's a short chain that's generated and a longer chain. We could have yet a third event where we have a distribution of following chain links from very small to much, much larger. And so the methods that we've developed come up with a generative model for these distribution of chain sizes. And as input to those models, we include the reproductive number, the r not the average. We include the variance in the number of secondary infections. We also include higher moments, the kurtosis, the skewness of the distribution and the number of infections. And from those, we derive the probability of an outbreak growing into an epidemic and the expected final size. Now for the simplest model, it turns out that you still only need two parameters. You need the r naught, and you need the second moment, which is something that can be readily estimated from contact tracing data. So here's what we've worked with. These were early estimates from Ryu and Althaus, it's the different Althaus uh, in 2020 for coronavirus. 
two, the causative agent of COVID, pointing out this issue that I highlighted before. So on the left, we have their best estimate of the reproductive number, the R naught, of somewhere around two, 2.5. So you have the R naughts that they're estimating over. On the x-axis, that gray blob is their prior distribution for a Bayesian inference procedures that they're running. And that blue history, that blue density plot is the resulting posterior distribution. So you'd find the highest point there, which is around 0.6 and you, you come down and you see it's around two. And of course we can derive the credible intervals from that as well. However, for the second parameter, and this is the one that turns out that really matters, this second parameter, the dispersion parameter, the variability in secondary infections, the importance of super spreading, this is what differentiates SARS and Ebola from influenza, even though they have the same r naughts, the same basic reproductive numbers. You can see their uniform prior distribution in gray from 0.01 to 10. Now, a little bit of a confusing thing about this dispersion parameter is that small numbers mean that it is over dispersed and you have lots of reliance on super spreading, whereas large numbers mean that it is under dispersed and you have really tight distributions around the R naught. So we have gray, which is their prior, and then their estimate from the data is, again, that blue density and you can see that that blue density is not very different from the prior distribution. Whereas if you look on the left, you can see that the R naught posterior distribution is quite different from the prior, which this is indicating that they don't have the right kinds of data. And that's not surprising given how early in the outbreak they were estimating this to really get a good sense of that dispersion parameter. And so what they're able to do is really bound the outbreak between something like SARS and Ebola that's heavily reliant on super spreading and something that's like influenza. And you can actually see that there's a little bit less certainty that it's down around SARS and Ebola. And that of course fits with what we understand epidemiologically, which is that we were not able to control this disease and prevent it from spreading despite the incredible links that China and other countries have gone to. So here on the x-axis, this is the proportion of susceptible individuals infected. And in red here, I'm showing you the results of that Kermack McKendrick approach, the approach that's being quoted in the news, that sort of 50 to 90%. The range there comes from different estimates of the reproductive number that have been put, published in the literature. So there's estimates from down around two to estimates that are as high as six or seven. And so that range there, it's not uncertainty, it's different point estimates of the reproductive number. And that dot, that's our favorite estimate. That's the one that the four of us think is probably the most realistic given all of the available data. But of course, that's an interpretation that we've made based on, on reading papers. It's still very much an open question what the actual reproductive numbers are for this, for this disease. In blue, this is what happens if we keep the same r naughts, so from two to five or six, but we include heterogeneity and transmission. So we account for the fact that some individuals will probably infect a lot of people and others will infect very few people. So now the range spans low R naught, lots of super spreading on the left to higher R naught, very little super spreading on the right. And again, that square is our favorite estimate of the R naught and of this dispersion parameter, the effect of super spreading. Now, what are those two X's? If we had an opportunity to have a back and forth, I would ask the audience what those two X's are. Those two X's are estimates from ongoing zero surveillance studies of what the true infected population size was in places like Germany, Italy, other areas that have run zero surveys to test for the total infected population size. So we're not accounting here for mobility changes because of physical distancing, other non-pharmaceutical interventions. This is still an outbreak that's just sweeping through the population. A super simple infectious disease model. All we're doing is accounting for variability in the number of secondary infections. And as a result of that variability, the expected final sizes shrink from 50 to 100% down to 5 to 40% and much more closely match the observed data, although obviously very preliminary. This, of course, doesn't mean that these populations have reached herd immunity. 
herd immunity where you've infected enough of the population such that you would really expect a low chance of any kind of large outbreak is still going to be much, much higher. And so this is part of why I was saying that this herd immunity strategy isn't going to work because these first waves are not going to infect, even if you let them go unchecked, a high enough proportion of the population such that you would be protected against subsequent waves of infection. This herd immunity strategy is based on a flawed model that we know is false that assumes things like random mixing, no variability in secondary infection, deterministic outbreaks. We also looked at this for smallpox, influenza in 1918, influenza in 2009, SARS in 2003, and MERS in 2013. And in all of these cases, we see that our estimates from the network model are lower than the estimates from the kermack mckendrick model and much more closely match the observed data on the total infected population size. So if you're not convinced that total infected population size is important, why else might we care about this variability in secondary infections? Well, one of the reasons that we might care is the feasibility of controlling diseases like COVID-19 depends on how variable the number of secondary infections is. Very nice paper published in The Lancet by Hellowell et al. showing that if COVID-19 had an overdispersion parameter like SARS, if it had a reliance on superspreading, a high reliance on superspreading like SARS, it could be controlled with contact tracing. However, in that same paper, they show in the appendix that if they assume values of the overdispersion parameter for 1918 flu, it cannot be controlled unless you can track every single case. You cannot have a single infected person slip through your contact tracing, which is functionally impossible. So part of the reason that we really need to understand what this value is, is we know that it's higher than SARS, which means that we're gonna have to use mobile technology and large cadres of contact tracers if it's gonna be effective. But we don't know exactly how close to influenza it is. We don't know exactly what percentage of the population we're gonna to have to include successfully in this contact tracing in order to implement these strategies. So what is working for COVID-19? Well, one of the things that's very clear from the early data out of China, from what's happened in Singapore, at least originally, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, is that non-pharmaceutical interventions, including physical distancing, closure of schools and non-essential businesses, sheltering in place, they work to bring this outbreak under control. However, one of the things that happened in China is the same that happened in the United States. It's the same that happened in Europe. It's part of the reason that putting cordons, cordoning off large geographic areas, closing borders is not an effective control strategy because cases are gonna slip through. And that's what happened in China. And we can see this very clearly by looking at the mobility data. So here we have the number of cases daily of COVID-19 outside of Wuhan, China, which is the epicenter, from January 1st to February 15th of 2020. You can see them growing exponentially fast until the cordoning off of Wuhan. And then you see it kind of plateau and fall off. What we were able to do is demonstrate that all of these cases, at least initially coming out of provinces from outside of Wuhan were seeded by travel events, meaning that you have an epicenter in Wuhan, lots of seeding of cases around China, as happened in the United States, as happened in Europe. What we've shown is the growth rate of these outbreaks in different provinces depends on the amount of mobility from Wuhan. So I'll explain this figure. On the x-axis, we have weeks from January 2nd to February 6th. On the y-axis, we have the growth rate. 
So if you take log two and divide by the y-axis, that's the doubling time in days. So 0 0.2 would be 0 0.25 would be around that sort of four to seven day doubling time that those values above 0 0.3 means it's doubling basically every day. We use data from Baidu Mobility Service, which is essentially providing data like Google does on high resolution mobility to map the movement of individuals out from Wuhan into other parts of China and show that these growth rates are being driven by the seeding of cases throughout China. And then the reduction in growth rates was due to the local measures that were put in place, namely the physical distancing, uh, closure of non-essential businesses, et cetera. So what are the outcomes of this? Well, there's two outcomes. One, measures like physical distancing work to bring the outbreak under control. That's great. Two, however, there are, turns out to be complex epidemiological dynamics associated with this kind of seeding and then spreading out from those seeding events throughout the population. So let me try to illustrate this. Imagine on the left, we have a population of four individuals, one of whom gets infected, then two of them are infected, and then after some time, everybody's infected. This is the standard model that we understand how to work with. And if I drew the epidemic curve, so the proportion of infectious over time, you would see that it goes up and it goes down, and under this super simple model, it would be sort of bell-shaped. However, what happened in China is that you have a bunch of different loosely connected populations, one person gets infected in Wuhan. Then that infection spreads both in Wuhan throughout Hubei province and then into other provinces seeding infection. And then after some period of time, we're actually not able to gain a lot of intuition from our simple epidemiologic models. We don't actually know what these infection curves look like. It turns out very influential paper by Watts, Muhammad, Medina, and Dodds showed that when you have this kind of hierarchical metapopulation structure, which means that you have these subpopulations that are loosely connected, you've got neighborhoods of individuals that are connected to each other that are within a city, that are cities connected to each other within states that are connected within each other. When you have this hierarchical metapopulation, you can get very interesting and complex epidemiologic dynamics as a result of this metapopulation structure, as a result of seeding out in different metapopulations. So here's the simple model. Spreading in a single population, you get a single outbreak peak that occurs. In a metapopulation with the same parameters, you end up with a much broader outbreak, much more extended, much less intense where the intensity is the sharpness of that curve. And as you start to vary some of the parameters, you get lots of different outbreak sizes, lots of different lengths of the infection, a huge amount of complexity generated really just because of this metapopulation structure. One of my favorite researchers is Letha Satinspiel. And part of the reason that I admire her work so much is because she couples very detailed anthropologic studies with very sophisticated mathematical and computer simulation models. One of my favorites is studying the 1918 flu outbreak in Canada using log data from the Hudson Fur Trading Company. So you have people that are showing up with furs, they write them down in log books all over Canada, and you can track the coming and going of individuals as they get sick, as they die, as they're replaced throughout the 1918 pandemic, and you can recreate the dynamics of what was going on with respect to this metapopulation mixing. And they show in this paper using those very detailed data. So here on the left, they have a diagram of three different um, trading posts and how people were moving around based on the log books. They have simulated outbreaks on the right in days and the number of cases in these three outposts. And you see this is the deterministic models. You see this spreading out as you get a wave in the first camp and then subsequent waves in the later camps. So what we wanted to investigate is what is the role of crowding, and I'll explain why we're interested in this, and epidemic intensity for COVID-19. So here we have two different provinces in China, Guangzhou on the left and Kuzo on the right, where you have really different distributions of population size. 
And what we've seen from very influential work in influenza is that different amounts of urbanization, different amounts of urban crowding lead counterintuitively to different epidemic intensities. So on the top here in the United States, we have the 10 most intense influenza curves by city, where intensity is how sharp the peak is. And on the bottom, we have the 10 least intense, so the 10 most spread out. Well, it turns out that those more spread out curves are happening in larger urban areas because you have this complex metapopulation structure, this hierarchical metapopulation where you have neighborhoods, slightly larger neighborhoods, parts of cities, cities loosely connected to each other across regions, et cetera. Even though you have more people, more density, you end up with a longer, broader epidemic curve because of this metapopulation structure. And so here they're showing population size in millions versus the epidemic intensity, the sharpness of that peak, showing that you have the sharpest peaks in the smallest population sizes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the population crowding, the population size all throughout China and look at the relationship between the COVID-19 epidemic curves intensity and the amount of crowding. So here's what we see across China. So on the right, we have the epidemic intensity as a chloropleth map. So darker reds mean more intense, lighter reds down into greens and blues are less intense. On the left, we have a plot of the epidemic intensity. So higher values mean sharper peaks versus the crowding in these different cities. Further to the right, much more crowding. And we see a similar relationship as was seen for influenza. So doesn't explain a huge amount of the variability, but a consistent pattern where smaller cities, less crowding, more intense outbreaks, sharper peaks, as was seen with the Hudson Burr for trade company data, as was seen in the simulation models from Watts et al. We built a similar metapopulation model for COVID-19, where we have sparsely distributed and more crowded metapopulations that exist in these three layer hierarchies, neighborhoods, cities, regions. And we can show that even in the no intervention scenario, you get on the right in the crowded settings, a much broader epidemic peak than on the left, much more intense outbreak. And for interventions, you basically get a, an effect where you shrink in that curve in the more crowded places. So why does this matter? Well, one of the reasons this matters is that we can then project the risk of epidemic intensity globally by looking at population crowding across the globe. And so darker yellows mean more risk of intense epidemics. You can see them kind of spread across that Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa border in Africa, uh, places in India, rural parts of Central and South America, et cetera. Why are we concerned about this? Well, we're flattening the curve because we are trying to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed. Intense curves lead to high risk for hospitals being overwhelmed. We want to avoid epidemic intensity. And in these rural areas, you have less coverage of ICU beds, less hospital workers, less hospitals in general per capita. So higher risk, although more uncertainty that it will occur lower resources. So coming to a wrap up here, why won't herd immunity strategies work? Well, I alluded to the fact that part of the reason they won't work is that you won't have a large enough fraction of the population infected in the first wave to prevent a second wave. So they won't work because they won't work. Another reason they won't work is that people, if they can, stay home even before they're told. So here's some data that we have from Cubic showing commute patterns from January 1st, basically through present. And you start to see them drop around March 12th. Well, this is Boston. We've actually never been ordered to shelter in place. We've been told strongly to do so and they've closed non-essential businesses, but there's no shelter in place mandate here. And these recommendations actually didn't come until March 24th. So we already see a precipitous drop in commute patterns because people are staying home. We've of course seen this in open table data with restaurant reservations dropping way before 
any public health measures were put in place by order. Wuhan is opening up again, but people are still not dining out. People are still sheltering in place, even though they're opening up. So part of the reason that the herd immunity strategies won't work, one, they won't work because you won't infect enough people, but two, people aren't just gonna go out and get infected, at least not enough of them to generate herd immunity. The other thing that I wanna mention is that we are seeing really striking and sobering effects of inequality and effects on marginalized and underserved populations from COVID-19. It's obviously unproven yet, but the mental model that I have is that wealthy individuals bring COVID into places and then poorer populations suffer the health burden. And so this is a very powerful essay in the conversation by Grace Noppert showing how COVID-19 is hitting black and poor communities the hardest. Part of the reason is that as the COVID-19, and I'm quoting from Nopert here, as the COVID-19 epidemic continues to ravage the American public, an unsurprising story emerges. Poor communities are hotspots for COVID transmission. The death rate for COVID-19 is staggeringly high among African-Americans compared to whites. The Washington Report's Post purports, for example, that 14% of the Michigan population is black, but 40% of COVID-19 deaths are among blacks. In the context of the current pandemic, blacks are more likely to have low paying jobs that do not allow remote work or offer health insurance or paid medical leave. The results of centuries of sidelining by American society plays out most obviously in terms of worse health. So all of these individuals that we think of as essential workers, working in the grocery stores, working, delivering for Instacart, these tend to come from lower socioeconomic, more marginalized populations. And so we're placing a much higher health burden as a result of COVID-19 on all of these individuals. Now, I understand that there are complicated economic effects that we need to consider. However, I also understand that under President Nixon in the United States, we were this close to passing universal basic income for the United States. Imagine where we would be right now economically if everyone had a guaranteed income above the federal poverty line. There are ways in which we can mitigate a lot of the economic effects that do not require opening up and killing a lot of people. It requires supporting communities, especially those that are feeling the largest burden as a result of this COVID-19 outbreak. Sam, sorry to interrupt, but we're close to the end of the hour, just letting you know. Great, thanks so much. I am uh, mere moments away from finishing, so very good timing, thank you. The last thing that I wanna mention is, like many other people, I have been critical of what we refer to as armchair epidemiologists. And over the past few weeks and months, weeks, I guess, I've become very concerned about that rhetoric. And the reason I'm concerned about that rhetoric is that I'm not an epidemiologist. As Michelle mentioned, my PhD is in evolution, ecology, and animal behavior. I don't have a master's in public health. I have no formal training in epidemiology. I have not worked for a public health agency. There are lots of individuals who can contribute to our understanding of a variety of scientific disciplines that do not have formal training in that field. There's of course a saying that I very much agree with, which is that you do need to have deep expertise, but we also need to have broad interest and collaborations across community and understand that just because your PhD or your master's or your bachelor's has a specific label on it, doesn't mean that you're not able to contribute intellectually to the community of people that are working, especially on epidemics. I think the real people we're talking about are entitled individuals who are ignoring the community, who are not participating, and who are actually drowning out voices of intelligent individuals with great powerful ideas that we need to support and give louder voices to. So I am going to be very careful going forward about the armchair epidemiologist because I really want us to have a bigger community of people. I want us to have a more diverse community of people. And I think that we can build that. So uh, Dr. Sarah Sugars, who gave a wonderful um, inaugural lecture in the Women in Network Science Symposium said um, during her talk and then on Twitter, every one of us has an obligation to work towards an academic community or any community 
where people of all genders, races, sexual orientations, and economic backgrounds, where all people are welcome, mentored, celebrated, and given space to share their work and ideas. And I really want that to be all of our charge right now, that we need to build a large inclusive community, especially around infectious disease outbreaks, because it touches all of us so very profoundly and touches on so many disciplines, meaning that no one person or no 10 people will have all of the expertise necessary to deliver the kinds of scientific applied and public health insights that we need. And so I'll skip over some of uh, the quotes and I'll end here. So I'm, I'm always a little reluctant to put up a quote from an old white male because almost all of them have, we will learn, have done something awful. So as far as I know, Oppenheimer hasn't, but if he has, please let me know so that I can remove this from the talk. But the reason I like this is because I think it also goes to this empirical theory divide, which I think is something that we have to continue to break down. He said in our seminars, and this is the chair of physics at UC Berkeley, Oppenheimer knew more experimental physics than the experimentalists did, and he could reel off figures and equations relating to the experiments better than any experimental physicist in the room. I think one of the really important things about, especially our integrative fields, our complex systems fields, is that we need to work diligently to understand as much as we possibly can about what's being done on the empirical, theoretical, and the joint side, both within our areas of interest, but also in related areas, because that's how we learn what the questions are. That's how we learn how to test the questions, how to interpret the experiments, what experiments can and can't be run, how we should be thinking about what measures in the public health sense are difficult, easy, have been done in the past. And so this tight coupling, not just making a large diverse community of people, but a large diverse community of people that embrace a large diverse set of methodologies to approach scientific applied public health engineering questions, I think is vitally important. So with that, I wanna again, thank Michelle and Juniper for organizing what's been such an exciting uh, series so far. I wanna encourage everyone to uh, attend uh, Janestra Bianconi's talk next week. I suspect it's gonna be really exciting and, and deeply informative about interventions and I'm happy to take questions uh, in the last few minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. This was a great talk and so informative. I think it's going to generate a lot of discussion for us. Um, we're 